In today's action-packed installment of organic chemistry, we'll be plunging into part three of our never-ending series on carbonyl compounds, the compounds that you love to hate. Many years ago, while I was attending Skyview High School in northern Utah as a lad, my friends and I worked diligently to invent substitute cuss words and phrases that might seem sufficiently tasteful to use in more public settings. I'm ashamed to admit that we never really succeeded. One of those phrases was the phrase, Hershey squirts. Thus, when I would stub my toe back over my mom's garbage can with the car or randomly trip on landmines as a high schooler, rather than use a more vulgar tirade of profanities and expletives, I would regularly yell the phrase, Hershey squirts! For some reason, my friends and I eventually began adding uh, or rolling our R's while using that phrase, thinking that it might make it sound more exotic, like Scottish or something. It wasn't uncommon then in my high school to hear one of us yell from down the hallway, Hershey squirts! I don't think it really actually made it sound more exotic, it just made it sound even more <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Well, as we approach our third and final installment on carbonyl compounds, you may feel tempted to release numerous expletives. If you feel that temptation, and accordingly wish to, I give you full permission to use the same phrase to which my friends and I recurred back in our youth, Hershey squirts. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Explain why alpha hydrogens are so acidic. Explain ketoenol tautomerism. Explain how to use LDA to form enolates. Explain how enolates and enols react. And know the products, reaction conditions, and mechanisms of this list of reactions. Before we go any further, however, I want to introduce you to alpha hydrogens. And what is an alpha hydrogen, you may ask? Well, an alpha hydrogen is a hydrogen that's bonded to an alpha carbon. An alpha carbon is a carbon that's immediately adjacent to a carbonyl carbon. So you can see that shown pretty clearly in this figure here. As you already know, carbonyl compounds exist in two different interconverting forms. The keto form over here and the enol form shown over here. The process of interconversion is called tautomerism. And as you should also already know, the keto form is the major one. Thus, ketone compounds like this one are naturally interconverting between their keto tautomer and their enol tautomer, with the keto being much more prevalent in solution. Since I'm sure you're all wondering, much like a child wonders where babies come from or why the IRS exists, here's the mechanism for ketoenol tautomerism. I'm not going to talk you through it, but I'll let you examine it on your own. I do, however, wish to point out one important aspect of this mechanism, and that is the word enol. You should note that the enol tautomerism is called an enol because it contains both an alkene and an alcohol. So if we look at this, you'll see a carbon-carbon double bond, an alkene, and an OH, that's an alcohol OH. Someone, some time ago, decided to take the word alkene and the word alcohol and squish them together into one word called enol. So that's where that word arises. I suspect that someday a similar thing might occur when Payless Shoe Source mer merges with Werther's original caramel company to make a new candy dispensing shoe conglomerate called Worthless Shoe Source. This leads us to our next question. What is an enolate? An enolate is nothing more than an enol that has a negative charge. This results from a base removing the alpha hydrogen. If I remove the alpha hydrogen, have a negative charge on the alpha carbon, you'll note that I could draw two resonance structures here. One shown here and the other with a double bond being between these two carbons and the negative charge being thrust up onto the oxygen. This kind of compound is called an enolate. Now alpha hydrogens are much more acidic than typical hydrogens bonded to sp3 hybridized carbons. Why you may ask? Well I'm going to tell you. Let's analyze this by looking at another one of my magical animated drawings. 
If we have a hydrogen bound to a typical sp3 hybridized carbon, as is found in methane, shown here, and a base removes that hydrogen, you'll notice that the conjugate base is this negative charged uh, species with the negative charge being localized on that carbon. What is the pK of this hydrogen? Well, it's around 65. To put that in perspective, if you had 10 to the 65 molecules of methane, and I want you to keep in mind how huge of a number 10 to the 65 is, only one single molecule of that uh, group would exist naturally in equilibrium in this deprotonated negatively charged form. Now by comparison, if I have a carbonyl compound like this, and a base removes the alpha hydrogen, it gives me this enolate. You will note, as we mentioned earlier, that this enolate is in resonance with this form here. What does that mean? Well, it means that this negative charge is not localized on this carbon alone. It's actually being spread by a resonance between this carbon and this oxygen up here. What does that mean about that negative charge? Well, it means that this negative charge is much more stable than the negative charge up here on the deprotonated methane. This negative charge here is stabilized because of resonance, thus being shared by two different atoms. How does that translate into the acidity of an alpha hydrogen? Well, the alpha hydrogen in a carbonyl containing compound is much more acidic than a hydrogen on methane, making the pKa of an alpha hydrogen somewhere between 17 and 20. To add perspective, we could say that an alpha hydrogen is 10 to the 45 times more acidic than a hydrogen bonded to a typical sp3 hybridized carbon. Why? Because of this resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Now the bulk of this chapter will center heavily on reactions of this type of enolate species. So I want you to have it at the forefront of, my, of your minds as we continue.